Using a VPN is easy. You click a button on an app and bam, you gain some magical internet armor. But if you look deeper, you realize that there's no magic in it. Protocols, ciphers, tunnels, kill switches. What does it all mean? The vision for this video is a VPN explained, layer by layer, with increasing levels of complexity the deeper we go. How deep you want to go is entirely up to you. Come on. Before diving in, it's important to understand what I call search bar basics. What is VPN and how VPN works? VPN stands for Virtual Private Network, a tool that protects your internet connection. It masks your IP address, the main identifier of any device that's connected to the internet, and that gives away your location. Plus, a VPN also creates a secure tunnel for your data to pass through. Usually, when you're trying to reach a website, your traffic first goes through an internet service provider, and then to your destination. Your ISP can see what you're using the internet connection for, while the website can see your IP address, and therefore, it knows your location. This is why you see local content, and along with it, local ads. On top of that, your traffic can be vulnerable to outside snoopers, be it advertisers, government agencies, or the not-so-friendly neighborhood hacker. With a VPN, your traffic gets encrypted, basically turned into a mishmash of symbols. This creates a secured connection and then travels through a VPN server to your final destination. In this case, the website sees the IP address of the VPN server and not your actual IP, so you gain a certain level of anonymity. All the heavy lifting happens behind the screen, while on your end, a VPN is just a simple app. You can use it on all the main operating systems, and learning how to use VPN is usually nothing more than clicking a few buttons. There are only a few cases where you'd have to set up a VPN connection manually, like with older devices that might not support VPN apps, or alternately, you might have trouble getting the app if you're living under harsh internet censorship. Some VPNs have browser extensions as well. While the app-based versions protect the entire internet traffic of your device, a browser extension only secures what you do on that specific browser. You can also get a VPN connection to cover other electronic devices, like gaming consoles, for example, though that can get a bit tricky. You either have to configure and share the connection from your computer or set up the VPN on your internet router. In this case, every internet using device in your house would be under VPN protection. With all that said, not all VPN providers are the same. Since this tool got so popular in the past few years, there are plenty of malware-ridden scams, apps that leech your data instead of protecting it, or ones that just don't work. That's why you need to do your research when choosing a VPN provider, including reputation, privacy policy, a proper server pool, as well as other useful features, which we're going to talk about in a second. And of course, always consider overall value for cost, as prices between different providers vary massively. If you want recommendations, I'll leave links in the description to Cyber News tested and approved providers. We've geared up with basic knowledge, so it's time to dive deeper. What are the main VPN use cases and features? As I've mentioned before, a VPN is first and foremost a tool for increasing online privacy. It also helps to secure your information when using questionable public Wi-Fi networks so that you don't get hacked. A VPN is also a good tool to battle ISP throttling which is when your internet service provider intentionally slows down your internet connection. In some places, ISPs can get paid to prioritize certain websites and slow down the connection to others. But once a VPN hides what websites you're using, it instantly takes that power away. Though now that the net neutrality law in the US is back in action, this should hopefully become less and less relevant. Nowadays, a VPN is also an irreplaceable tool for accessing restricted content. For example, most streaming services limit access to their libraries based on your location. So if you're connected to a server in another country, you'll automatically get more varied content. But this getting of content can sometimes veer into very questionable areas. I'm mainly talking about the dark web. You can imagine the entire internet as an iceberg. The surface of the web is everything that's searchable and doesn't need any authentication to access. Underneath that, there's the deep web. Your emails, your social media, or your work accounts, anything that requires accounts or specific information or identity to access it. The deep web holds about 7.5 petabytes of information and makes up about 95% of the World Wide Web. About 5% of the deep web is the infamous dark web. It's hard to tell just how much space it actually takes up as it's very difficult to find and study. But if you're determined to take a peek inside, a VPN is crucial. The dark corners of the internet are not a place you want your details exposed. Then there are some more niche use cases for a VPN, but a good portion of them are closely tied to features. Like obfuscation. 
it disguises VPN traffic, making it appear like a regular internet connection. This is how a VPN can help you bypass network restrictions in schools or workplaces. However, the main point of this is to help people who live in regions with internet censorship. With VPN obfuscation, they can use the internet freely and securely. VPN split tunneling is another important feature. It allows you to divide your internet traffic, directing a part of it through the VPN server while keeping the rest within the regular connection. Apps like Spotify and Weather Widgets don't really need VPN protection, while things like torrenting clients can greatly benefit from the anonymity it provides. Lately, it also became really popular to offer ad blocking capabilities. It would be a bit of an unusual VPN usage if you only got it for that, but it's a great additional bonus. These features block unwanted or malicious advertisements and pop-ups before they reach the user's device. A lot of providers have enhanced versions too, capable of blocking trackers and preventing you from entering malicious sites. NordVPN even designed their ad blocker to go as far as being able to block actual malware as you're downloading. There's one feature that's almost always essential no matter what you're using a VPN for and that's the kill switch. In case your VPN connection drops, it automatically disconnects your device from the internet. This way, your IP won't be leaked and along with it, your data will stay safe. So when learning how to use VPN, make sure to always enable the kill switch first. Speaking of leaks, you also need to know about DNS. It's what translates your regular domain names like youtube.com into an IP address, kind of like a phone book for the internet. When you visit a website, a DNS query is sent to a DNS server to retrieve a website's IP address. But if this process gets sent outside the VPN tunnel, your ISP can then see what website you're visiting, even if the contents are encrypted. Most of the best VPNs have DNS leak protection by default, but make sure to check this before committing to a VPN provider. Of course, lots of VPNs have even more stuff inside apps, but for that, it's time we move on to the next layer. Let's talk about advanced features and technical details. Some of the best VPN providers offer more features than others, usually with a focus on enhanced privacy and security. For example, you can often find double VPN servers. Between providers, this feature might be named differently, but they do roughly the same thing. Route your internet traffic through two VPN servers instead of just one, adding a second layer of security. This makes it much harder for anyone to track your online activity. But for ultimate anonymity seekers, some VPNs have Tor integration within their apps. Tor, or the Onion Router, is a free overlay network for anonymous communication. It directs your traffic through multiple random servers known as relays or nodes. The final layer, or the exit relay, then sends the traffic to your destination, making it impossible to track down where the traffic originally came from. The VPN and Tor combination can go both ways. Onion over VPN first connects you to a VPN server, encrypts your traffic, changes your IP, and only then it accesses the Tor network. The VPN over Tor principle works the other way around. This allows you to visit websites that normally block Tor traffic, but it's much more difficult to configure, doesn't protect your IP address from the Tor entry node, and doesn't hide the fact that you're using Tor from your ISP. So you're sacrificing greater privacy for a handful of additional websites. You might also have heard about the port forwarding feature. It can redirect traffic from one port number to another, enabling external devices to connect to a specific device within a private network. This is mostly useful for torrenting as it makes the file sharing process much faster. That said, this feature is pretty rare due to some security concerns, mostly port fail, a vulnerability that allows an attacker to expose the victim's real IP address or even access the shared files. So what do you do if you still want to share files or connect to another device over a VPN? A good workaround is NordVPN's MeshNet feature. It allows devices to connect directly to each other, which opens an array of possibilities, including remote LAN parties. Besides features, another thing you might encounter in VPN apps are different IP and server types. The usual IP address that a VPN gives you is known as a shared IP, meaning if there's a lot of people connected to the same server, they can often get the same IP. If you want a dedicated IP address, that's a whole separate service. It's much more costly for VPNs to have one IP for a single user, so you have to pay a significant amount of money to get it. IPs can also be static or dynamic. A static IP remains the same all the time. This is the way a dedicated IP works. Meanwhile, dynamic IPs change each time you connect, enhancing your anonymity. And that's what most regular VPN servers use. You can also get your IP to change throughout the connection. That's a special IP rotating feature, which is helpful if you're worried about cross-site tracking. 
So far, the only VPN that has that is Surfshark. But it's not just IPs that can differ. There are two different types of servers as well, physical and virtual ones. Physical servers are the ones that you can actually touch. That is, if you can somehow get inside a data center. But they simply give you the IP address of the location that they're actually at. Virtual servers, on the other hand, are kind of like functional imposters. They're often made for locations where establishing physical servers is limited. For example, having a physical VPN in India right now would mean being forced to collect extensive customer data. To battle this, some VPNs have virtual VPN servers running on physical ones in other locations, but the IP addresses mimic the ones in India. This way, you get access without compromising your data. Once you start understanding the VPN features and capabilities, one very important question arises. What powers it all? The main stars of the show are the VPN protocols. There's a variety of them, with the most popular being WireGuard and OpenVPN. These are responsible for establishing secure communication channels for VPN connections. If you go even deeper, there are transmission protocols like TCP and UDP that govern the actual transmission of data packets. TCP offers reliable and error check delivery of data, making it suitable for cases where data integrity is crucial. UDP is faster and more efficient, making it ideal for things like streaming or gaming. Think of it like tennis balls. TCP is basically handing over a ball, in this case, a data packet, checking if the receiver takes it, and only then handing another. It's stable and reliable, but also slow. Meanwhile, UDP throws the balls and keeps throwing them until they're all gone. This significantly speeds things up, but slightly increases the chances of some balls being dropped. That said, most tunneling protocols rely on UDP. Only OpenVPN lets you choose between UDP and TCP. In this case, you can look at OpenVPN as a reliable ATV, capable of navigating various terrains. While OpenVPN was the standard for many years, currently the most popular and widely used protocol is WireGuard. It's a lightweight VPN protocol which aims to provide better performance and security. Think of it as a sleek, high-speed train on a secure track. Its streamlined design and efficient operation allows for swift and reliable travel making it the preferred choice for those seeking speed and security on their journey through the internet. The creator of Linux even praised it as a work of art. Some VPNs build their own protocols, like ExpressVPN's Lightweight, or make improvements to existing ones, in the case of NordVPN's NordLynx protocol, which is an updated version of WireGuard. But no matter which protocol you use, they all have one thing in common, encryption. We often throw this word around with very simplified explanations. A secure tunnel, a layer of protection, a mash of symbols. But what actually is it? Encryption is the process of transforming readable data into unreadable data using algorithms and keys. The original data is known as the plain text. And after encryption, you get what is called the cipher text. The most popular algorithms for VPNs right now are AES-256 and ChaCha20. AES-256 is a type of symmetric encryption, which means that a single encryption key is used to encrypt and decrypt the data. It divides the information into blocks and encrypts each block separately. This is known as a block cipher. Imagine you want to encrypt the content of a book. With AES, you rip it into pages, encrypt them one by one, and then sew them back into a now encrypted book. Now, ChaCha20 is also symmetric, but it uses what's known as a stream cipher. In this case, if you want to encrypt a book, you go through each letter one by one, so it's a continuous stream of encryption. Either way, encryption wouldn't happen without a key, which is kind of a key concept. In this case, a key is a string of characters that encrypts the data, and only someone with the right key can decrypt it. This is also where public key infrastructure, or PKI, comes into play. It works by using digital certificates, sort of like digital passports, that verify your identity and the identity of the VPN server. After this, PKI helps to encrypt your data and send it like a letter with a tamper evidence seal. If the seal's broken, you know that the message has been altered, so this ensures the integrity of the contents. For now, VPN encryption is pretty much uncrackable. Or is it? I hope you're ready for the last layer of VPN secrets, because this is where some really complex stuff comes into the picture, from VPN traffic analysis to quantum computers. The latter is what's threatening current encryption methods as a whole. For now, quantum computers still sound a bit like magic, and that's because of the strange way that they work. 
Regular computers operate in a linear pattern. Every calculation boils down to the same two numbers, also called bits, and each bit can either be a one or a zero. That is, until quantum computing came into the picture. Quantum bits are capable of being both a one and a zero at the same time. This way, qubits can process multiple things simultaneously, which leads to incredibly fast problem solving. And that's where the safety of cryptography comes into question. The traditional way of encryption relies on mathematical operations that would be very time consuming to reverse. We're talking billions of years. Meanwhile, quantum computers theoretically could decrypt codes in a matter of hours. For now, you can rest easy with your VPN. Both AES-256 and ChaCha20 are considered to be quantum resistant. But since there's no telling just how powerful quantum computing might get in the upcoming years, post-quantum cryptography is already being developed. Though, that's a topic for another video. Let's move back from the future to current day issues. And in the case of VPNs, that issue is traffic analysis. Not everybody likes the fact that you can suddenly hide your data, bypass censorship firewalls, or access geo-restricted content in a matter of seconds. So of course, they've tried to find ways to detect and block VPN traffic. There are a few methods to do this. It can be as simple as time zone mismatch detection, comparing the actual browser time zone with the one of the target server, or cross-referencing IP addresses of known VPN servers, aka database validation or behavioral analysis, analyzing network traffic patterns such as timing and destination. Then there's protocol fingerprinting, identifying distinct characteristics of VPN protocols. Deep packet inspection is kind of similar, but focused on the content of data packets, looking for specific patterns, keywords, or signatures within them, which is much more complex and intrusive. Whatever the means of detection, you'll likely experience being denied access to a website because you're using a VPN. And that defeats the whole purpose of having one. So are there methods to solve this? Of course. We already talked about obfuscation before, disguising VPN traffic as a regular internet connection. That's one of them. DNS leak protection also helps in this case, as it defeats DNS-based traffic analysis. And then there's the simple strategy of making sure that your chosen VPN frequently updates its servers and IP addresses. This helps against the cases of known VPN-related IPs getting blocked. This is also why the most common solution when encountering a roadblock in your online journey with a VPN is simply switching a server. We went full circle in terms of difficulty here, but sometimes even the most complex problems can have simple solutions. For now, we've got VPNs unraveled as much as we can in this video. Of course, there are many more VPN-related topics out there, from jurisdictions to RAM servers or creating your own personal VPN. So if you'd like to learn more about these too, leave a comment and subscribe to the channel. I hope you found this technical dive into the layers of the VPN inner workings as fascinating as we do. In case you decide to grab a VPN yourself, check the description for the best VPN provider recommendations. I'll leave a few discounts there as well. Thanks, and see you soon.